Uh, all right, go now. <laughs> On today's show, finding faith in Fallout, exploring redemption in a broken world. We're discussing both the Fallout video game series and the TV show. So make sure you stay tuned in and we'll talk about it here in just a sec. Welcome back. This is Reverend David Petty alongside my co-hosts, Russ Dornish and Brian Swift. And today we're going to talk to you about the Fallout universe. And let me just tell you, if you are unfamiliar with Fallout, Fallout is a TV series based on a video game that was based on other video games. We've had, I think, five or six Fallout games and now a TV series. I'm sure somebody out there has written books. But the Fallout universe is basically one in which there is a post-apocalyptic wasteland and there are people that have been dwelling in underground vaults waiting for the perfect time when the surface uh, landscape will be ripe for them to come out and repopulate the earth. Well, surprise, surprise, as we find out in the video games and in the TV show, the wasteland that is up on the surface has actually been inhabited, but it is not as perfect as they might think for repopulating. Vault dwellers emerge from the vault to find a wasteland where lawlessness is rampant, where uh, anything goes, and where it's almost like the days of the old wild, wild west wild west not west but the wild west and so the vault dwellers all of whom are kind of a, a cultish uh rule following bunch they've been living in the vault for hundreds of years uh you know repopulating their own vault uh waiting for that time so these vault dwellers come out into this post-apocalyptic wasteland inhabited by different groups different clans uh by the brotherhood of steel which are a group of people that uh, wear heavy armor and these vault dwellers then have to try to grapple with what is actually going on in this wasteland and how do they find their way around russ anything you would add to my description of the fallout wasteland or brian having played a couple of the games yourself uh yeah so the one thing and it's funny you know now with the tv show and that's part of the reason we're wanting to talk about this you know a lot of people are getting introduced to the first time the fallout series and franchise and i remember watching with my wife and the one thing she was confused about she was like i don't get it what's the time frame that we are looking at here because this feels like the 50s but there's robots and flying cars the best way that i can summarize it is that it's supposed to be considered what they say atomic punk retro futuristic is how it is uh described and it kind of meshes that 1950s post-war culture of the united states along with kind of the hope of technology and then the the lurking fear that is a nuclear fallout which is what leads to the universe and the world that everybody lives in today so uh, everybody lives in a, in a part of, of society where, you know, they're, they're afraid of an apocalypse. The apocalypse happens. A lot of people have planned for it. That's the vault dwellers. Uh, they've created these vaults and locations for really rich people to go underground and be safe from these nuclear blasts and explosion. Um, and each vault is very unique in what they have within it. We won't do any spoilers for that. Uh, if you want to look up some of that stuff online, I don't know if they're eventually going to cover it in the TV show or what that's going to look like. But uh, needless to say, that's kind of where the whole series goes. And the thought for today is to talk about a specific perspective when it comes to the games. Because the number one topic of the entire game is really having to do with struggle of power and morality. And of course, being a Christian podcast and a Christian group, the struggle of morality, lawlessness, of you know all of this type of thing, the struggle for power, I think is a central theme to not only us as Christians, any religion, but then also the world that we even live in today. Um, so I want to kind of go through that. We're going to go through overall what that looks like. But just know that obviously when it comes to an apocalyptic uh, culture and place, uh, the wasteland is going to bring a lot of lawlessness, desperation, 
struggling for power between the different factions that are within the game that form as would in any society that we have, you know, discovered and studied throughout the years. So with the overview of Fallout, I want to jump to some of the questions and kind of start discussing this. And Brian, I want to hear your thoughts uh, first on this. But so moral choices and consequences. So from your time playing, and the cool thing is we all have very different points of view when it comes to the Fallout series. Brian is an early Fallout player. I am a more in-between Fallout player. David's a more recent Fallout player. And then David and I have seen the TV show, which also goes through that. So we're going to have all kinds of angles when it comes to this. But what do the moral choices that are presented to you in the game, what does that look like to you, Brian? And what was kind of your experience going through that and the feelings you had when you had to make different kinds of decisions? Yeah, I think I think Fallout's an excellent RPG series in terms of giving you some legitimate uh, moral dilemmas, some very difficult decisions, uh, and and many times often giving you an outcome that maybe you're not expecting. Um, so at times, you know, the the choice that it maybe at the time seems to be the obvious good choice doesn't always have uh, good results. Um, and so I think in in that respect. Fallout tries to be, even though it has kind of this, uh, you mentioned that, you know, the 50s aesthetic. And one of the other things that Fallout really has is like this kind of really dark sense of humor. And a lot of times it, it does things that are, uh, you know, darkly funny. Um, and and oftentimes it, it actually does a really great job at that. Uh, but it also kind of pairs that with this, like these legitimately difficult, decisions that can happen, uh, like, a, like we said, moral dilemmas. And I think that makes it a very like compelling mixture, um, as a game series where, um, even though there are at times a light tone and, and again, a darkly funny tone, it also, you know, does give you those deep meaty choices that, uh, that good RPGs have. Yeah, David, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, your playing? And then obviously with our experience with a TV show, we won't go into like late series or even middle series spoilers, maybe just the first two episodes so that we're sure. not really spoiling anything for anybody. But what are some of the moral dilemmas and choices you remember from either your playthroughs or the TV show that we've recently experienced? Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, the compelling thing for me, uh, kind of like Brian was just talking about, is that you have this world where you're <clears throat> you're playing as a vault dweller, right? And and you've been brought up in this world of rules. And in the in the TV show, you follow along with a vault dweller, and she has this very clear sense of moral right and wrong, right? It's like you know, killing people is wrong, like very clearly. Like, this is the end, of, you know, it's like clear line. And she encounters these these points at which she has to struggle with, like, well, okay, but this person might kill me, and Maybe, you know, you can't just trust everybody. Maybe there is a time where you have to decide between yourself and someone else. And and there were many times I remember in the games where, yeah, you had to make choices like that. It's like, do you kill this character or do you not? Do you follow this character or do you not? Um, one of the, the classic things in Fallout 4 is you actually have to choose between three different factions, the Minutemen, the Brotherhood of Steel, or I think it's the Children of Adam like science people, the, um, the Institute and then the railroad. <clears throat> right. So, um, yeah. So you have to make those choices that will change the gameplay for you. Uh, and so depending on how that goes and kind of like Brian talked about too, sometimes what you think might be the clearly obvious right choice is not necessarily clearly obvious and right. And perhaps even later in the game, you find out, Oh shoot, I thought that was right back then. But maybe I'm in the wrong here. This is this is tough. So um, that's what I remember. I want to talk a little bit, if if we can. Uh, are we ready to chat about the the specific characters in the first episode? Yeah, let's introduce uh, some let's, folks let, to them. Let, let's jump to that, and we can talk sure. about kind of the decisions that they make as the uh, first couple episodes go through. Yeah. So um, as we as I you know as Russ mentioned, we've got Fallout, uh, the TV show that we start off in Vault Thirty Three. And when we start off, we meet this character, Lucy. 
who is the main character. She is, uh, you know, newly getting ready to get married. Um, you know, she is uh, finding a partner in a partnering vault. We learn all about the vaults. Uh, we meet this nice guy, her father, who in this picture looks like he's standing in this like Iowa cornfields uh, farm kind of a thing. It's actually just a backdrop. You know, it's pretty clearly uh, from the moment that they pull the camera out. So you realize this is this uh, picturesque, you know, perfect vault. Um, so then we meet, um, oh gosh, I'm going to call him, is it Maximus or is yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Maximus who is uh, training to be a knight in the brotherhood of steel. And he, of course, again, is, is brought up in this kind of cult of the Brotherhood of Steel and given very clear rules in how things are going to be in the Brotherhood of Steel to become a knight, to get to wear the power armor, the uh, T-60 power armor. We're also introduced to uh, this guy here, the ghoul, uh, played by Walton Goggins, and just does a marvelous job. And uh, there's so much to his backstory, I can't even tell you, other than you have to know that he's been alive for like hundreds of years. And... Um, yeah, it's basically like a zombie type character, but but super smart. Um, but my favorite part here, right at the very beginning, when Lucy emerges from the vault, is that we're introduced to these characters here. And so you've got Lucy, who's in this perfect vault outfit. You know, everything is perfect. Everything's great. And then we've got this scientist type of guy that you learn more about when you watch the show. And then we've got this person who's been living in the wasteland for a long time. Hair's a mess. You know, she's wearing all sorts of different things from different uh, places that she's gotten. She's got trinkets. And so there's this beautiful interaction between the two of them. And, and Lucy thinks that everything is just, you know, okie dokie, easy peasy kind of thing. And uh, this woman is like, you have never been in the wasteland before. That's not how it is up here. So I just love this, this juxtaposition of the world of clear cut rules amidst the world of no rules at all. Uh, and you got to figure it out as you go, which is where we follow Lucy for the rest of the uh, series. Yeah. And so, you know, some of the morality and moral choices that, that Lucy has to make. And again, you see that, like you said, from the get go, they live in this kind of utopian paradise. Everything's kind of great. You get your jobs, you do your normal things. And then Lucy's life is turned upside down and she is required to go out into the wasteland uh, in search of a specific mission. And as she does it, she still has that that vault mentality of everything is okay. And humans by nature are okay. Like I've never dealt with a bad human in my life. And so I think that humanity is just really good and, and almost that kind of perfect Eden view of what humanity is supposed to be like, and that there is no bad in the world. And there is no evil. And there is no, you know, all that. And I love right off the bat, the first person that she runs into, uh, the scientist in the middle of the night, and he, you know, comes up on her because she's just sleeping next to a fire. And like, luckily, he's not somebody that's looking for something else. He's somewhat of a good person, um, you know, rescues her from being attacked by a very large bug, explains to her like, hey, that is the dumbest mistake you could have made lighting a fire at night here like and falling asleep without knowing anything like you obviously do not know what you're in for turn around go back to your vault because you are going to die um and it's that kind of morality choice of he's being kind of the the he understands what a vault dweller is you know that right off the get go he has ties to that because of his you know scientist background and to to kind of hear him say that and tell her like go back you don't understand how things work it's not I'm I'm probably the nicest guy you're going to meet. And even I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. And so it's just really interesting seeing those morality paths. And what works really well with the show is the intertwining of the main characters. So like you said, you have Lucy and you have her perspective and what's going on. You have Maximus and Maximus has this perspective of the brotherhood of steel are these like heroes. It's like Superman. And it keeps replaying the first time he ever met a uh, soldier from the Brotherhood of Steel being saved and rescued as a child and smiling at this like giant 
armored person saving him. And he slowly starts to learn more about the process and more about what his life is like. And you see him start to change his morality perspective on everything. And then same for, you know, Walter Goggins character, Walton Goggins character of the ghoul is, you know, he's this mercenary that has been alive for hundreds of years, probably been through the worst of the worst, has nothing to live for, doesn't care about anybody but himself. So all of his moral choices are based on that. And so we get three very different perspectives and they all come together looking for the same goal and the same kind of future. And it's just really interesting to see how each one of them helps the other change their perspective and change their morality in order to survive. And that is really what the Fallout series is all about. It is how do we adapt and how do we evolve our morality to fit with the world that we live in? So when we look at that from a Christian perspective and we look at that from a, you know, what we have in our lives, you know, one of the big discussions I want to kind of do is, you know, talk about the, the concept of sin and its consequences and what these moral dilemmas really do for us. Because we face those on a daily basis as well. So, David, being the pastor, what are some things that you discuss with people when it comes to sin and moral dilemmas and how to kind of attack that? Because some are easy, black and white, don't kill. That's an easy one. But some are not so easily black and white. And so you as a pastor, what is your perspective and how you discuss that with people based on the scenarios that they're in? Yeah, I, I think the neat thing that's happening in the Fallout series uh, is that Lucy is undergoing her own kind of uh, what we in the church world call deconstruction, right? She's been given this, this inherent built-in set of rules, and, and she's got the rule sheet in front of her, and she follows every single one of them and says, okay, you know, I've been told this is good, this is bad. It's like This is like Leviticus, right? Like, don't eat pork, don't eat, uh, you know, the boiled milk of a mother in the, you know, so you can't eat cheeseburgers and, you know, all sorts of, of restrictive rules that, that are still what, you know, kosher Jewish folks use today. Um, but you've got these restrictive rules about clothing and marriages and property. And, and suddenly you get out into this real world and, you know, as time goes on in the Bible, you realize, well, maybe some of these rules work really well and some of these rules don't work so well. Some of these rules are applicable and some of these are not anymore, right? And there's many places in scripture, and I think we go through the same thing as Christians today, where we have to actually kind of put these rules to the test and say, okay, is this an ancient rule or is this really a sin, right? Like, is it really a sin for me to eat a cheeseburger? Well, we need to define then what sin is. Um, often people def define sin as something that breaks the relationship between you and others, you and God or God and others, right? You've got that kind of triangle of sin. And most things that are sinful will fall into those categories, right? So like murdering, obviously, it's not good between you and your neighbor. Uh, it's not good between your neighbor and God because you break that tie by murdering them. Um, so like there's two out of three, right? Uh, and probably not good between you and God either because, you know, you're murdering somebody else. But, you know, a cheeseburger, maybe not so bad. And so I think Lucy's got to take these things as she goes out of the vault and into this world and say, okay, I've been taught this is how the world is, but maybe it's not really like that. You know, <laughs> maybe not everybody's good. Maybe not everything is safe. Maybe not everything is perfect. But I love the fact that that throughout this series too, she tries as hard as she can to hold to a sense of hopeless optimism and to believe in the best in others. Right. And so there are times when that pay, that pays off for her that, you know, she as this vault dweller can come out and say, well, I know you all are distrusting of each other, but, but what if we actually tried trusting, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think that's, that's also then an interesting point where, you know, people who have been through difficulty, been through trauma, sometimes spiritual trauma in churches, you know, might have to try to reconfigure themselves and say, what does it look like to learn to trust again after you've been hurt? So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a lot, it's <laughs> a lot of things there. 
um, but that's great. my my take on it. Yeah, so, no. I mean, it's just a wonderful exploration of um, of morals and faith and and what do you believe about humanity based on where you've come from, Brian? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think also something interesting about this is the idea of sort of the the rules we set up for ourselves that we're following rather than necessarily following God's rules. So, you know, in a lot of cases, we as Christians, we have certain preconceptions maybe that we've gotten about, you know, what we are supposed to be doing, you know, um, and, and th there's things that we follow maybe because of tradition or whatever that we think of, you know, as being a good person, there's rules, kind of cultural rules that are in place a lot of times that aren't necessarily biblical, right? So I, I think that's also important too for us as Christians. Like which of these rules is actually, you know, which which of these things is actually important for us to follow? And, you know, there's some things that we maybe have been taught that that aren't biblical. So I, I think that's also an important perspective of kind of learning and and using for us as Christians, we're going to use, you know, the Bible as our North Star, as our as our guide to, uh, you know, to teach us which, you know, which of these rules are truly God's rules that we, you know, should endeavor to follow. All of us are going to fall short. Obviously, we're going to sin. Um, that's sort of inevitable, right? Um, but but there's also things that maybe we're taught that like, oh, you, you know, you should be doing this. And, uh, you know, and those rules aren't aren't biblical things. So, you know, I think there's a difference there too in terms of the way that we can learn uh, over time and what we can use as our guide. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's I think it's it, it's interesting with the with the the show going back to that too. You know, I I do love the fact that Lucy is a very good example and character for what we somewhat need to strive in, especially early on. Um, even when she does eventually meet the ghoul even though when she meets you know the other people and they do bad things to her like she's not even willing to do it back to them like she's willing to give second and third chances and be like i feel like there's something good in you like even if you say that i'm stupid for believing that i still do i still find and think that something good is within you and within and that's almost like the the kind of the the basis of what we as Christians have to experience when it comes to the world and understand that things are not perfect. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that are bad in the world. Um, you know, I was even just looking up some verses on morality and suffering and just kind of the ways that things are going. Um, and one verse that popped up was uh, Romans 8, 18 through 21. Um, which is, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And, you know, Lucy is in a, like, take our broken world and multiply it by like a hundred. Um, and that's kind of the experience she has with all the horrible things happening constantly and everything that's kind of just, you know, happening so horribly. Uh, and it's just, it's impactful to still see that she kind of still holds on to that little bit of decency and morality that she was taught uh, and how that works. And, you know, honestly, when we think about the games, like we can bring that morality of ourselves into the game, in the decisions that we make. That's the best part about an RPG is we can bring our own thoughts and decisions and be like, okay, I like this character or this character has rubbed me the wrong way and I don't want to save them or I want to save this one. And it's just very interesting how we end up bringing those choices into the games that we play. Brian, since you're more of a, a game angle on this for the Fallout series, do you remember or can you think of like things that you know or even just in RPGs in general – that you like, like, what does your character look like? What are the decisions you're making? What is kind of the direction and compass that you use when making those decisions within an RPG? I know some people are like, I want to be the opposite of myself in real life. 
or I want to follow this, or I want to even be better than I am in real life. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that when you're playing an RPG and how you make kind of the moral decisions? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Russ. I did want to give David a chance to step in because I think you might have, it looked like maybe you had something to say in response to what I said. Oh, I, I think I, there was a tiny thing I just wanted to say, um, which was that uh, there is a point in the series, and I won't spoil anything, but uh, just that there is a point in the series where Lucy really has to, um, she has to question everything that she thinks she knows. And, and there's a wonderful perspective shift where she gets to see things outside of her normal perspective and then try to try to figure out, do I hold on to the paradigm that I've always had or do I challenge it? Um, so if you haven't gotten to episode six yet, there's, there's an interesting moral dilemma and perspective shift in episode six, uh, where she's gotta, she's gotta make some choices. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say anymore. I want to say so much. I just can't, but, um, yeah. That's good. I, I think our perspective is really important too. Um, but going back to the question you just asked Russ, in terms of, you know, the way that we play RPGs, I often play through my first session almost as myself. Okay. I usually make the choices that I would make as a person. Um, but I, I have at times, you know, if the, if the RPG is really compelling or if there are story hooks that I want to see what the outcome would be, I have gone back and like played as a different version of myself that maybe makes different choices. <laughs> um, and so, you know, uh, I, I think that's a, I, I think that's a fun thing to do, to be able to explore that. I know we've discussed that on the podcast before, but, but, you know, I think the best RPGs give you multiple branches that you could see like, oh man, I really want to explore this other branch. I wonder what would happen. Yeah. David, you know, same idea for you. Um, also as an RPG gamer, um, what is kind of the direction that you take when you're playing, uh, you know, I know one of your favorite games of all time is uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah. Were you a good cowboy or were you a bad cowboy? Uh, I honestly don't remember how I ended up. I think I was I was mostly on the good side. Um, okay. Like I didn't I didn't specifically try to live a good path or a bad path. Um, sometimes it's hard because, you know, like I always love to point out in that game, you're like trying to pet your horse and you accidentally like punch your horse and then your horse kicks a guy who's walking by and then he shoots at you. And the next thing you know, you're like wanted by the law and you're out for $500. And you're like, I was just trying to pet the horse. I just couldn't remember which button was which, <laughs> but um, you know, but so much of that game, like I was trying to do good. I tried to donate a lot to the camp and, you know, I, I tried to make um, kind of like I, like, uh, I guess like Brian says, you know, I just kind of do what I would think would be right. Uh, unless there's a very compelling story arc to be like, what if I totally did the other thing, right? Like what if I, yeah, I've heard that this game plays well, if you finish it as an evil character, let's try that. Or, uh, you know, some of the moral dilemmas in Detroit become human and the way that that game pushes you down one path or the other. And the fact that even like you're playing as three different characters, and character branches can just end. Like you can just kill the character on accident. And then it's like, well, here's the other two characters you get to play for the rest of the game. And you're like, I, but I, you know, um, but it's, yeah, I think the moral dilemma is the fact that you have choices. Uh, another great game for that is um, life is strange where literally everything in the game is a major choice. And it warns you. It's like, if you choose this, it will change everything about the game. And you're like, Oh gosh, but uh, what's the right answer? Should I prevent the person from hurting the other person or should I mess with time? I don't know. Um, Russ, what about you? How do you play moral dilemma decision games? You know, I'd say 99% of the time I try and do the right moral decision. I just feel weird about the bad one. I never like the decisions and choices that you do because most of the time it's like killing characters immediately in the game rather than seeing how their, you know, interactions play out, how their lives play out, what all that looks like. You know, some of the games that I can remember throughout my life that I've played that have had those great decisions, you know, um, the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic series where you could be uh, the good Jedi or the bad Jedi. 
Um, you know, Star Wars Unleashed, Star Wars in general, you know, has its own morality uh, decisions that we could make, you know, based on that. Same thing with uh, Red Dead. I, I did go good, you know, for that one. I tried my best. Like you said, it's kind of hard. Sometimes you make mistakes. Uh, but most of the time in those games, I will make the obvious, you know, nice, right decision. I just don't like playing as evil characters or, you know, doing that because I I like a lot of the characters I interact with. There's never one that I'm like, I definitely want to kill you unless they're a villain, a bad person, whatever. So, you know, that's kind of my, my view and, and, and how I go through games moving. I want to ask yeah. if, if I could tag to that, that answer. I know you're a platinum gamer <laughs> and I know sometimes there's probably like evil things you got to do for that platinum trophy. How do you deal with that? When, when you're being forced to make the unwanted moral decision. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Not a lot of times will the developers force you into that direction. Now, games okay. like Detroit Become Human and Heavy Rain and, you know, those story you finish games, all paths, right? Yes, you do. So you do experience it all. Um, and so that that is a part of it. And it's fun to experience just to get to experience those story paths. But for the most part, games are pretty good about when it comes to the Platinum of letting you make your decisions and not really having it affect a specific trophy, especially because trophy hunters absolutely hate the need to play through a game a second time if they don't have to. And most of the time when you're talking about, when you're talking about good and bad decisions, uh, it becomes very difficult. But to use an example recently, um, I platinum demon souls and that game, like at one point you do have to kind of go evil because you have to kill every single NPC in your home base uh, in order to acquire specific items that they're holding for a trophy. So you kind of have to go on a, a rampage there and just kill off all these NPCs that you've been using and working with. Uh, and it's very interesting to do and kind of, you know, be a part of. But again, it's a very quick and easy thing at the end of the game that you've already beat the game. You've already done what you needed. And now you have to kind of branch off. So, I mean, most games are pretty good about that. Um, when it comes to morality, the opposite side of that, uh, and one thing that, you know, moral choices kind of leads us to is that redemption arc. And I think the Fallout series is one that is full of redemption, not only in your character, but mostly in some NPCs that you run into. Um, one that I wanted to highlight um, is uh, if you played Fallout 4, uh, one of the big main characters is Nick Valentine, the synth detective that you run into, who becomes a part of your party. Um, and, and his big issue, which I think kind of relates to Walden Goggins' character in the fallout TV show, which is they struggle with their identity and their past. They struggle with where they came from, why they are where they are today. Um, and as a player in the game, you end up delving into Nick's backstory. You discover where he came, you know, pre-war detective, what his name was, uh, how his consciousness was transferred into this synth body in the Institute. And then Nick is constantly grappling with those feelings of guilt and worthlessness. And through his interactions throughout the game, he gets that purpose and helping others throughout your journey with you. So if you make the, the nice decisions and you go with the you know good morality path, you end up redeeming Nick Valentine in the process of being your NPC partner and character that follows you around, which is a really fun thing to see. And I see that so much in different games. Another game that I really quickly reminds me of is Mass Effect. You know, a lot of your party members are evil characters that you still bring in and through your choices can, can manipulate them into becoming good rather than the evil that they were maybe originally and vice versa. There are good characters that as you become evil, they trust you so much as a character that they are then willing to follow you into your path down the evil side and the non-redemptive story. Um, so Brian, let's start with you. You know, what are your thoughts, you know, whether it was in your experience with the Fallout series or any video games you've played with, kind of what are your experiences and thoughts on the redemptive path that you see with that? Yeah, I think redemptive arcs are some of the 
you know, most compelling storytelling that we see in role-playing games. Um, they're really, they can be really, really rewarding. Um, and it is, it is a really cathartic and great moment when a character that you've been kind of slowly bringing along in this path, um, you know, ultimately starts to make, you know, makes a choice. Sometimes it's a self-sacrifice or, you know, that kind of decision, um, that they wouldn't have made in the past. Maybe they're a very selfish character, um, you know, or maybe they were a character who just always tended towards, uh, you know, making the quick and easy decision, you know, oh, I'll just steal this or I'll just kill this guy. Um, and then ultimately they're, you know, they're redeemed. Those are very, you know, powerful uh, story arcs and they're, they're super rewarding. Um, I always... I tend to really enjoy that. I'm just, you know, I think, I think that's just, I, I think part of that might be that, you know, we're kind of wired that way too, that redemption is a very powerful human thing that happens in our lives. And, um, you know, I think we identify strongly with that. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes that, uh, you know, that kind of story arc so powerful. What do you think, David? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's fascinating when you look at the Bible as a whole, right? Because it is, it is a redemptive story of underdog people who lose over and over and over and over again. And most, most stories we hear are written from the perspective of winners and victors and, you know, the, the people who win get to tell the story. But I think right? The story of the Bible that makes it so compelling. And I think like you're saying that that is tied with our human nature as well is that of redemption, right? Like we, we understand what it's like to go from the way that things were in the past and seeing a bright new future. You know, it's the reason that we're, we are um, driven towards seasons where we see some seasons of renewal and seasons of springtime after, you know, wintertime when things have been dead and decaying and, you know, now there's new life and we see that spring and spring forth. Um, so yeah, I think in video games too, I think, I think we as human beings are drawn to video games that tell redemptive stories. Um, you know, and far more so the redemptive stories than just, you know, here's a video game with people beating up on each other, you know, I mean, beat them ups are fine too, but yeah. <laughs> um, to kind of conclude, and and David, I want your real perspective here. You know, again, from your background and all the experience that you have. But when it comes to redemption and what we as Christians need to view redemption as, and why is it important, and how does that kind of relate to our Christian background, and uh, obviously the the story of Jesus and the Bible. Uh, relating all that back to what redemption really should be for us. Yeah. I think when you look at Jesus, the thing that Jesus is telling people over and over again throughout the gospels is he's giving them a fresh start, right? He's, he's coming to people who are down and out people who are lost people who are broken people who have done horrible things. Right. And he comes to them and says, um, I don't blame you for that. I don't treat you as if you are your past. Uh, you have sinned and you're now forgiven, go and sin no more. Uh, you know, you were broken, you're now healed. He gives an opportunity for a new fresh start to all of the people that he meets. And even if it's just to say, hey, you've heard it said, this is the way that you should live. Let me offer you a new idea. Perhaps try this other way. You know, you've heard it said an eye for an eye. Well, I tell you that, you know, here's a different way. Um, you know, you, you want somebody slaps you on the cheek, we'll offer them the other cheek. Love your enemies. Um, so Jesus offers this fresh new perspective, which then I think when we apply it to ourselves, we can say, hey, look, you know, as Brian said, we are all sinners. We've all sinned. We're all going to sin. That's part of human nature is that, that we miss the mark, right? We We go astray and we are imperfect people. And that's not the entirety of our story. And so Jesus offers us that perspective to say, You've done some horrible things, but here's a new fresh start. And so I think then the the powerful thing for us is also then to take that and to apply that when we see other people. And so we see somebody who has had a bad year. We see somebody who's had bad luck. We see somebody who's done horrible things. And we say, 
I'm going to try to see you the way Jesus sees me and the way I believe Jesus sees you. And so I know society has labeled you as a blank, but I see you as a human being worthy of God's love. So I think that that redemption that Christ offers us, we can offer others, and that can transform the world. I mean, so I think it's interesting then that the way that Lucy and Fallout comes out here with this kind of positive, hopeless optimism uh, or, or endless optimism, you know, there's, there's moments in there where you go, well, maybe, maybe that optimism could change the world. And it's maybe not so much a wasteland. I don't know. I think that's great. Uh, Brian, any final thoughts that you want to kind of add when it comes to redemption and just the overall uh, themes that we're talking about today? Yeah, I I think, you know, RPGs give us a, an opportunity to explore RPGs like Fallout and the whole series give us an opportunity to explore, uh, you know, decisions that we make and deep moral choices uh, and, you know, help us think about, I think, I think we can think about who we are and the kind of decisions we want to make. Um, but it also kind of gives us a safe place to explore that. And I think that's, that's really powerful. And again, as, as we mentioned before, um, you know, we're able to, we're able to see, uh, these sort of redemptive stories and we see echoes of our own story and we see echoes of stories that, you know, we see in the Bible as well. Well, that's going to do it for today's conversation of redemption and faith in Fallout. Um, we appreciate you for joining us today. If you haven't seen the Fallout series and you are of age, it is a mature TV show, as well as the game being very mature. Uh, but if it's something yes. that you're interested in, you know, um, that's you know, something really awesome to check out when it comes to being a gamer and being able to see that. Uh, and then something I would love to see is... Um, Drop down below in the comments of YouTube or wherever you watch this. Let us know what are the ways that you play through RPGs and choice-based decision games. You know, what are your thoughts on the Fallout TV series and the idea of morality in it? And just any of the topics that we discussed here. We love hearing from other people and we love seeing the discussion that happens within the chat. Um, and you'll see us jump in and comment as well. So we love to have kind of the back and forth with that. And of course, make sure you check out our Discord, which you see down below on the screen. If you want to join and have more of the conversation there, uh, we would love to have you be a part of our community where we get together fairly frequently um, to chat about games, nerd culture, movies, all of those wonderful things. So again, we thank you so much for watching and make sure to go to our website at crossfirecast.com to find out more information about who we are, what we do, and where you can find us. Uh, for my co-host, Reverend David Petty and Brian Swift, thank you guys so much for joining us today. You guys are awesome. You are loved. You are wonderful. God bless. And we'll see you next time.